also turn to the neighbor on your right and tell them that you're so excited to see them this morning. And turn to your neighbor on your left and say, your hair looks really nice today. All right, we're going to get started with worship. We're going to sing a new song today. It's called Wrong About You, and it is about how sometimes we frame God in some weird mindsets in our head, and, and they're not always true, and so this is a great song that declares that. I'm so glad that God is not the boxed-in God that I have sometimes made him out to be in my head. So let's sing this out. I used to believe so many stories that you wouldn't like me if you knew. That I had to strive to see a glory. Mm -hmm. I was taught to believe that you were distant. That you track me down if I am missing. The grace wasn't free, I had to earn it. Had to earn it, but I'm unlearning it. I'm so glad I was wrong about you. Sing, I'm so glad I was I'm so And I used to think that you were angry That there were conditions to your mercy And if I worked hard enough then you would save me Well you would save me But I'm unlearning and I'm so glad I was wrong about you Oh I've never been so glad to get it wrong I'm so glad I was wrong about you Oh, now my heart can sing a different song I'm so glad I was wrong about you Nobody's listening And I'll dance And nobody's watching I can't help it Now that I know The truth about you The truth about you And I'll sing like nobody. Oh, I'm gonna dance I'll dance and nobody's watching I can't help it Now that I know The truth about you The truth about you And I'll sing like nobody
above every other name. And Jesus, the only one who could ever say, oh, you are worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you.
build our foundation. We want to build our house. Lord, your firm foundation. We want to build our house, our lives upon you, God, because you're a good God, Lord. You're a stable God. You're a loving God. You're a kind God.
Center our lives around you, God, that, that you are our firm foundation, Jesus. Safety through all ages, Jesus, through whatever comes. No storm, no storm is stronger than you, Jesus, and, and we just pray that. That's evident in our lives, God. Make that true in our lives. Allow us to believe that, that no matter what comes our way, Jesus, you are with us. These last few weeks, God, you are with us. Be with us, Jesus, today. And in all of our days, your name, amen. Awesome. Thank you so much. Come on, one more, one more time. Let's give it up for our chapel band for leading us this morning. Beautiful way to start out a Wednesday. For those of you who had like two or three classes before chapel started, I don't even know if that's possible or not, but if you did, God bless you. For those who are just starting out your day, welcome and good morning. Hey, there's only like one and a half more weeks of chapel. There's only like three more weeks of classes and then finals week. And then for those who are graduating, graduation. Where are the freshmen at? You're almost done with your first year of college. Come on, let's give it up for the freshmen. The freshmen sit in that section right over there, just in case anybody. Where are the sophomores who are almost halfway through your collegiate career? That's what I'm talking about. Year number two. Uh, juniors, you're almost a senior. And seniors, you are almost up out of here. Um, it, is, uh, it is good to be together uh, again, uh, grateful for our, our worship uh, uh, band to lead us into this space this morning to reflect. And, and in reality, we're, we're going to get back into the university passage, which this year has been uh, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapters 5 through 7. And we've spent time in the first semester in the fall going through chapter 5 mostly. Uh, we, we've had a couple of opportunities this semester to look at chapter 6. And then today we'll look at seven and kind of bring the, the Sermon on the Mount series to a conclusion. 
uh, for this year. It's been awesome to be able to reflect on the words of Christ and this powerful teaching uh, that he brings in the Gospel of Matthew chapters 5 through 7. Uh, but really the theme for this morning as we get toward the end of Jesus' teaching, uh, he finishes with this analogy. And the analogy that he uses, he says, if, if anybody hears these words that I've been speaking to you, again, remember, he brought uh, the, the disciples, there were multitudes that gathered around Jesus to hear him teach toward the beginning part of his ministry. He had just been baptized in the Jordan River. He was taken into the wilderness and tempted by Satan. He left that temptation and shortly thereafter moved out toward this region close to the Sea of Galilee and began to teach. And because so many people had gathered around him, he needed to move up a little bit higher onto kind of a, a, a plain area that was overlooking the Sea of Galilee. And it was there that he delivered um, this teaching called the Sermon on the Mount, and he goes through, and we're going to recap in just a moment some of those themes and some of the things that he taught from this passage, but then he gets to the end of it, and he says, if anybody hears these words of mine that I've been teaching, and if you actually do them, if you actually put them into practice, if you actually rely on them and allow them to soak into your soul, your heart, your mind, transform who you are so that your words and your actions reflect what I've been teaching you, you would be like somebody who built their house upon a firm rock foundation. It says, because when the storm comes and the winds blow and the rain comes down and the floods come up, right, then your house is going to stand firm. But for those who listen to these words that I've been teaching and you disregard them and, or you think to yourself, you know what, that's outdated, that's old school, you know what, I don't need to live that way, I've got my own way of living, and you hear the words of Jesus and I hear the words of Jesus and, and we decide, you know what, I don't think I need to do all that, I think I can do it my own way. He said, you are then like somebody who tries to build their house upon sand, or in other words, a, 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 an unfirm foundation that shifts. And so when the, when the storm comes, when the winds blow, when the rain comes down, your house that you're trying to build, in other words, your life that you're trying to build, will not be placed on a firm foundation. And so that's the conclusion of, of, of the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus comes and essentially says, you've heard me say a lot, now go and do it, Right? Go and put it into practice. And it reminds me, when I was a kid, uh, I grew up, I'm the, I'm the third of three kids in my home, so I'm the youngest. Do we got any other youngest in the crowd this morning? All right. Okay. That's a lot of us. All right. We should start a club or something. Uh, youngest kids unite. Um, we could work on it after. Come see me after chapel. Um, I remember being a kid, and one of my dreams as a kid, I don't know if it's because of the movies that I watched, there was this movie called Three Ninjas. Anybody, Jason, you remember that movie, Three Ninjas? If the rest of you have heard of it, you're weird because it's an old movie. I'm just kidding. You're not weird. I take that back. Um, but but in, that, in that movie, they had like this really cool clubhouse in their backyard. Um, and another movie that I really liked was Home Alone. Um, and in one of the Home Alones, you know, um, Macaulay Culkin, or what was his name, Kevin McAllister, he had his own clubhouse, and his clubhouse had a zip line that connected from the clubhouse all the way to his room with, like, a bicycle uh, handlebars that he would use with this really cool pulley system. Anyway, all that to say, I had always wanted my own clubhouse. So my older brothers, when, you know, they, they thought, you know, let's make a clubhouse, right? Cobra really wants a clubhouse. Let's make the guy a clubhouse. So they went and got a bunch of leftover plywood from a neighbor that was working on a project, and they put it out on the side, and they brought it together, and they started nailing plywood together, and they had the audacity to create a two-story clubhouse made out of plywood with no two-by-fours or any kind of other structural reinforcement whatsoever to the point where I looked at it, and I was like, no, nah, I'm good. Like, good try, but uh, that ain't going to work, right? Sure enough, not too long after that, that... Uh, House of Cards fell. And so, you know, I never really got my clubhouse. I'm still working through the trauma of that. Um, but you know how we do when we don't get what we want. Later on, you have a family and you think to yourself, my kids are going to have a clubhouse, right? So this clubhouse is kind of a, an extension of my, my childhood pain. And, uh, and so 
Uh, I thought to myself, I'm going to build a clubhouse for my kids. They're going to love it. It's going to be just like the movies, and it's going to be a dream come true. So I go to the store. I start buying wood. I get two by fours, right, because I'm like, I'm not going to make my kids a plywood clubhouse, right, two by fours. Uh, got wood, got paint, got everything. And, and my son, my oldest at the time, was like uh, four years old. And so he helped me draw up the plan. So I said, what do you want this thing to look like? And he started drawing it. And guess what he came up with on the sheet of paper? He put, uh, he put mouse ears on the top. He said, Dad, I want Mickey Mouse Clubhouse. That's the one that I want. So I was like, I don't know if I could do all those shapes, man. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking something square, you know, like something... <laughs> A little bit more manageable. We, we could paint some, 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 uh, some ears on there later on if you want. Uh, so, so he was kind of already from day one disappointed that he wasn't going to get the Mickey Mouse Clubhouse. Um, and, and so I was like committed to making this thing awesome, right, for my kids, even though my brother came over to my house as he saw me down the road making this project. And he said, hey, man, is this project for your kids or is this project for you? And I was like, get out of here. Who invited you over here? <laughs> uh, so so I'm, I'm getting ready to build this clubhouse, and I'm excited. And I call my father-in-law because my father-in-law has all kinds of experience building things. He's been a roofer. He's been a mate. Like a, uh, he's worked with cement and, and all these different kinds of things. Uh, and so I'm like, I want to have him come over to make sure I'm doing this thing right. And so he comes over. And I said, check it out, look at I got all the materials right here. And so we're going to work on this first, and then we're going to work on that. And he was like, all right, cool, come with me. And so I started following him, like, what's, does he got a new tool for me or something? Is he going to surprise me? Like, hey, you're building a clubhouse. You're going to need to have a good saw or this, that, or the other. So we go to the back of his truck, and all I see back there are four shovels and about ten heavy bags of cement. And I'm like, what's this? And he says, yeah, move the wood to the side because before we get to that part of the project, we need to dig some holes. Because the design that you want to build is going to require something to be firmly planted in the ground before we could start putting anything on top of it. So I'm like, oh, man, come on. I, already, I wanted to see this thing start to come up out of the ground and, and, and be really proud of it. But instead, what we had to do was take out the shovels. And I'm not even kidding you. For an entire weekend, all I did was dig holes. My four-year-old Joseph started, and at first it was kind of cute because he had like his own little plastic shovel right next to me digging holes. And after about five minutes, he was like, yeah, I'm over this. Like, call me when it's time to start hammering things and painting some stuff. And he bailed on me, and so me and my father-in-law there all weekend. Next weekend, what do we do? Out there digging more holes. It's got to be bigger. It's got to be deeper. We got we to gotta widen them out a little bit. My wife and others come out to check, check the progress of our clubhouse. Hey, let's go check out how they're doing back there with the clubhouse. And they come out there and they look and they don't see anything. It's just like horizon, you know. Like, hey, how's it going with the clubhouse? Like, good, man. Look at my hands. I got blisters and all this kind of stuff. Yeah, but I don't see anything. And the reason why it was difficult to see anything was because in order for us to get the end result, we first needed to do the hard work of digging deep holes. We had to get deep into the earth. We had to open it up so that it was ready to build a firm foundation. Let me tell you something, and this is what Jesus says at the end of chapter 7. If you want to build something that lasts, you need to have a firm foundation. If you want to build a life that lasts, it needs to have a firm foundation. And we believe that that firm foundation is none other than Jesus Christ. So Jesus in the sermon, we, I'm going to go back in a second and look through some of the things he taught in 5, 6, and 7 of the Gospel of Matthew. But he comes out, and this is the beginning of his ministry. Mind you, even though it's chapters 5 through 7, be reminded that this is toward the, the front end of Jesus' earthly ministry. And so people are still getting to know Jesus. In fact, probably just days earlier is when he was walking along the coast of Galilee, and he called his first disciples to follow him. So they are still understanding and getting to know who he is when he teaches the Sermon on the Mount. It's kind of like an intro to Jesus. And what does Jesus think about who God is? And what does Jesus want to teach us about the kingdom of, of heaven? And so he begins to teach through this section of scripture that we call the Sermon on the Mount. And the sermon is not easy. 
He goes hard. He digs deep. He starts hitting us right between the eyes. He starts stepping on our toes with steel toe boots. He gets all up in our business, and he starts calling us out from day one. I love that. It's way different than like if you've ever, has anybody ever bought a car before, new or used, right? Okay, so I've learned a lesson that if I'm going to buy a car, I have to go by myself first because I know the tactics of the salespeople, right? They want to get you in the top model first. They don't want you to check out the economy, basic version, right? They want you to see the best of the best so that everything else you step inside after that feels terrible, right? They get you inside that best model that they have, and then at that point, right, uh, the, one of the biggest mistakes I made when I went to buy a car is I took my, my son, the same guy who bailed on me when we were digging holes. One of these days he's going to be watching these videos when he's older. He's going to say, Dad, why would you say all those stories? And, and I'll, I'll apologize to him. He was with me one time, and, and when he went in there, like, I know the salesperson knew they had us because my, my son got into a car, and he was like, Dad, this is our car. I was like, how can I say No. Right? And that's what they do. They get you, they show you all these different things. And what's the last thing that they tell you? How much it costs, right? That's like one of the first Spanish phrases that I learned as a kid. Cuanto cuesta, right? So I can make a little deal or something wherever I am, right? Because you get in, you're like, how much does it cost? I, I, yes, it's great. I like it. It looks really cool. How much does it cost? How much is this thing going to cost me? And that's what I love about Jesus' teaching style is in the Sermon on the Mount, he gets right into it and from chapter 5 already begins to say, I want to invite you to follow me, but I want you to know it's not going to be easy. I, I want to invite you to be one of my disciples, but I want to let you know that this is going to be the hardest thing you'll ever do in your life. See, one of the things that we have a challenge with in the church today is we often want to give people uh, uh, the invitation to all of the rewards without understanding what the costs are without understanding how challenging of an invitation it is to actually follow Jesus, right? We want to say, yeah, you're going to have eternal life and your sins are going to be forgiven. And man, it's going to be awesome to have a new kind of hope and peace in your life and joy. And, and trust me, I love all of those things about the invitation to follow Jesus. But can I tell you something today? Following Jesus, if we do it right, is actually really hard. It's actually really hard. It's actually easier on the front end, to not follow Jesus because then we could just do whatever we want, whenever we want, however we want it, without anybody telling us what we can or cannot do. When in reality, Jesus says there is an expectation that our Heavenly Father has. It's called His will. And He wants, His will is for things on heaven to, to look like they are on earth. And in order to do that, we ought to follow Him into that regardless of how challenging it is. So Jesus he starts with the hard stuff. In fact, I love it. It starts even before we get to the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus is taken into the wilderness and he's tempted by Satan. And what does Satan tempt Jesus with in the wilderness? He tempts him with an easy life. He says, man, aren't you hungry? You haven't eaten in 40 days. Check out those stones. If you're really the son of God, turn them into bread and have yourself a sandwich and everything will be all cool. Make it Mike's way. And Jesus says no because... Man doesn't live on bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. And then he tempts them with power, and he tempts them with fame. And, and, and time and time again, Jesus says, I don't need self-sufficiency. I don't need the power that you're offering. I don't need the fame that you're offering. I am who I am. When he was in the River Jordan, just a little bit before that temptation in the wilderness, he heard a voice from heaven. His heavenly Father looked down on him and said, this is my son whom I love. In him I am well pleased. And it was from that affirmation, from that identity, from that belovedness that he then lives out the rest of his ministry. He wasn't looking for comfort. He wasn't looking for things to be given to him easy. He wasn't looking for self-sufficiency. He knew who he, who he was. He knew that he was loved. And so he lived the rest of his life. And he taught the way that he did because he was connected to a heavenly father who already had shown him the love that he needed. So he, he, he's ready, he comes out and he's ready to, to go deal with the hard stuff. And, and so what does he teach them about the hard stuff? You see, he says, I want to teach you about this kingdom. 
It's called the kingdom of heaven. It's the kingdom of my father. And it's so different than anything that you've ever seen. In fact, the messages that we often hear in the world that we live in and in our culture today are things like this. You know that you're blessed when you are problem free, when you are healthy, and when you are wealthy. If you've got all those different things, that's what blessedness means. We hear messages in our culture today that say things like this. Don't waste your time caring about other people's problems. Just focus on yourself. We hear messages like this, go and build your own kingdom, or get even with your enemies and pay them back for what they've done to you, or store up as much stuff as you possibly can on this earth. And Jesus comes, and the first thing that he teaches are, blessed are, and he goes through a list of beatitudes, and he talks about different circumstances and characteristics of those who are blessed. He said, blessed are those who are poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who are persecuted. In other words, Jesus is saying, blessed are those who often feel excluded and left out as if they don't matter. Let me tell you something, you do matter in the eyes of your heavenly Father. Keep your head up. Jesus tells them. He says, blessed are the humble, the meek. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. He says, blessedness isn't just about what we have or how happy we are. And, and, and instead, he says, blessed are those who probably didn't think they were blessed. And then he goes into the next section of chapter 5, and, and he looks at his disciples and he says, let me tell you something. Uh, you, you may have all kinds of different thoughts about who you are, but I want to tell you two things that you are. One of them is you are salt. And he says, and you are light. And he says, well, if you're light, if you're, if you're light of this world, then nobody lights a lamp and then puts it away and hides it. Instead, he says, uh, being a light of the world essentially means we're like a city up on a hill at night when the lights are on. You cannot uh, not see those lights regardless of how far away you are. And Jesus says, I want you to live your life in such a way that whenever you step into dark places, people know where to go. He says, you are salt and you are light. Then he says in, in, again in Matthew 5, I didn't come to abolish the law and the prophets, but I came to fulfill them. And he goes through a series of teachings where he says, you've heard people say, but I say unto you. And, and all of those things that he's teaching them and reteaching them revolve around these truths. One, that we are to love our neighbor as ourself. And then he challenges them to do some things that are pretty radical. He says, hey, I want you to shock the world. And this is the way you're going to do it. Love your enemies. Pray for them and bless them. That is harder to do than it is to say. Because each of us can say, oh, yeah, I want to follow the way of Jesus. I want to love my enemies. But how many of us are really ready to say, Lord, I know that person just said this to me, but I'm going to pray for them and really pray for them, not like gossip pray for them. Some of you be trying to pray for your enemies, but you're just throwing shade on them in the form of a prayer. Right? You're like, Lord, I pray for my roommate because they are messy and uh, inconsiderate and uh, selfish, stinky. You're like, no, 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 don't be, when you pray, don't, don't start throwing shade on, on your roommates or anybody else. No, 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 Jesus actually invites us that when we're not getting along with someone or when we don't like what somebody has done, the natural tendency in our human nature is to disregard them, cancel them, throw all kinds of words at them, not want anything to do with them. But Jesus says the difficult invitation that I give to you is to not do any of those things but to get down on your knees and literally come before our Heavenly Father and say, Lord, I, I want you to be with that person. Whatever they're going through, whatever's in them that's causing them maybe to do the things that they do or act the way that they act, Father, I pray that you would miraculously touch their heart and transform them and allow them to know who you are, to know your love, and to know your presence with them. Jesus is inviting us to intercede and pray for and bless those who we don't get along with. How different would the world be if we actually followed this invitation? See, even within the church, for whatever reason, we feel like we can highlight certain portions of Scripture and follow after them, like, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, right? Oh, we want to we highlight Jeremiah 29, 11 and think about my own prosperity, but have we highlighted and put on the wall of our room what it means to love our enemies and to pray for them? That's a convenient one to forget. That's a convenient one to leave out. When in reality, Jesus is saying, if you really want to follow me and, and this way of the Father, what it looks like to be a citizen of heaven, then we got to do the things that are hard. 
We've got to do the things that aren't easy. We've got to do the things that we don't feel like doing because following Jesus into the kingdom of heaven most of the time means getting outside of our comfort zone and being willing to live like Jesus lived. Man, this is hard stuff. And I'm so glad that Jesus talks about it up front. Right? He doesn't do like many of us do and start giving everybody all the benefits and why they should follow him. And then later on, oh, by the way, if you really want to keep following me, you've got to do all these other things in the fine print. Two-point font, right? No, he's 24-point font, right up front, bold. The invitation to follow me isn't easy, but I invite you anyway. He continues in Matthew chapter 6, and he says, when you give, don't do it so you get a lot of attention and people think you're so good because you're generous. When you pray, don't pray out loud so that you're impressing people with the words that you use. When you fast, don't make yourself look like you're all tired and everything so people can think you're really special and holy because you're doing all these religious things. Jesus says when you do those things, in other words, do them, but do them with the right heart and motive so that you can restore a relationship with the Father, not to be noticed by others because following Jesus often means means doing so from the depth of our being, not from the external or the exterior. Right relationship leads to right actions, which should be done with the right motives. And then he finishes in chapter 6 by talking about stuff. Right? He says, don't store up all of your treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. And then he says, don't worry about what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, what you're going to wear. He says, I got you. We're going to have this stuff taken care of and figured out. Don't live your life from insecurity. Don't live your life wondering whether or not you're going to have enough because when we do, our human nature causes us to go to the other end of the spectrum, to another extreme, and all of a sudden, when we were insecure about not having enough, we then become greedy. When, when, when we are dealing with uh, this, this pain that we have that we might not uh, make it through, then all of a sudden what happens on the other end? We, ended up, we end up becoming selfish and not thinking about anybody else. So Jesus challenges us to say, hold on to your stuff loosely because you don't really belong here anyway. This is just a pit stop on the way to your ultimate destination, which is being a citizen of heaven. So then it takes us all the way to chapter 7. And in chapter 7, he continues, and he, and he kind of steps on our toes once again. And he starts out chapter 7 by saying, hey, stop judging each other. Stop criticizing each other. And then, and then he uses this really cool analogy, and he says, it's almost like somebody's trying to get a small speck out of their, their friend's eye, when in reality there's a huge plank sticking out of their own eye. Jesus says, first, look in the mirror, notice what you have in your eye, take it out of your eye, and then once you can see clearly, then go ahead and help your neighbor out by making sure that the little speck that they had in their eye gets taken out. In other words, Jesus says, we're so busy focusing on everybody else's deficiencies and faults and throwing shade and criticizing and judging that we don't actually go into the mirror and say, what's in me that needs to change? Where am I off? Where have I not been right? And Jesus says, go and focus on where you're at first before you start trying to fix other people, right? What I love about that passage is he's not saying don't stop trying to help others out, but he says is make sure that while you're doing that, you don't forget that you've got some issues too. Come on, raise your hand if you got issues that you know God's working on in your life. And you're like, Lord, you ain't done with me yet. There's stuff in me that needs to get worked out, right? That's all of us. So Jesus is saying, hey, let's deal with each other graciously, right? He talks about in Matthew chapter 7, a narrow road and a small gate. He says, go that way. He says, because broad is the road and, and wide is the gate that leads to destruction and many are going to go through it. So this is him kind of highlighting what we've been talking about throughout this entire Sermon on the Mount series, which is he's saying, do the hard thing. Don't go the, the, the way of the path of least resistance in the culture that we live in and simply go that way because it's the most comfortable. But Jesus says, learn to be comfortable being uncomfortable so that we can walk on the narrow road and enter through the small gate because it's really challenging to follow the way of Christ. 
He says, in fact, there's going to be a lot of disciples and teachers who use my name, but in reality, when they get to heaven, I'm going to look at them and say, I never knew you. Why? He says, because by their fruit, you will know them. In other words, by our actions and the way that we live, not by what we call ourselves, is how we will be determined true or false disciples of Jesus Christ. So he talks about how difficult it is. He's like, don't judge others. Walk through the, the, the narrow road and the small gate. All right? He says, be careful not to be false disciples or false teachers. And then there's this interesting section in Matthew 7 that, uh, that, 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 that really, I believe, in a lot of ways, becomes a foundation for the entire thing. And it almost doesn't fit. If you're a biblical scholar, New Testament scholar, biblical studies student, and you're studying this passage, you might understand what I mean when it gets to this section in Matthew chapter 7, and all of a sudden he says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. And then he explains that instruction by simply saying, if a son comes up to his father, if a child comes up to their parent and asks them for a piece of bread, are they going to instead give them a stone? Or if a child asks for a fish to eat, will you instead give them a snake? He says, if you who are kind of wicked as human beings give your children good gifts, how much more then does your heavenly father give you good gifts? This is really powerful teaching where he says, ask, seek, and knock. Why is that important? I believe that's important because when I think of these vices that we have, that we wrestle with, pride, greed, lust, all these different things that we wrestle with that are addressed within the Sermon on the Mount, honestly, if we un unpack those and kind of peel back the layers a little bit underneath them, what you'll often find is insecurity and fear. And where does insecurity and fear come from? I personally think it comes from not knowing that I have a good father who will give me things when I ask, who will allow me to find when I seek, and who will open the door when I knock. But Jesus says, you got, a, you got a good father who knows what you need. You can be secure in your knowledge of who you are. You don't have to live and operate from fear. In fact, uh, Scott McKnight in his commentary on Jesus' sermon, says this, what Jesus does here is complex. He creates self-awareness leading to self-judgment. This leads to humility, which in turn leads to repentance and sanctification. This leads to the kind of humility that treats other sinners with mercy. It creates a kingdom society shaped not by condemnation, but humility, love, and forgiveness. So I want to finish with Matthew 7, verses 24 to 29. This is how Jesus concludes the Sermon on the Mount. He says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. Let's pray. Jesus, we recognize that the invitation that you give is not one that is easy. The kingdom that you describe is countercultural and maybe even upside down. And if we're honest with ourselves, we're tempted to follow a different kingdom that values power and control, fame, self-sufficiency. But we want to follow you. We want to be your disciples. We want to bear good fruit. 
We want to do our best to walk on that narrow road and enter through the small gate. And we want to build on a good foundation, and we believe that foundation is you. Give us strength and courage as we continue to try to follow what you invite us to, especially when it gets tough and hard and we don't think we can do it any longer. Would you surround us with encouragement, with people, with the body of Christ, with our local church, friends, family, that will encourage us to continue following you even when, especially when, it's hard. In your name we pray. Amen.